Welcome to Face to Facts. We hope you're all doing well. I'm Nick Face. Sitting to my right today, we have a newcomer on Face to Facts. That's Brad Augustinelli. Welcome. Thank you. Happy to be here. We are here to talk a little bit about the crash and burn team, known as the Boston Red Sox, <laughs> a little bit. And, of course, talk about the rest of the Major League Baseball playoffs. Because even though the Red Sox are not in the playoffs right now, first of all, it's still very exciting. Mm -hmm. And number mm -hmm. two, each of the teams, amazingly, that are in this playoff have some sort of a connection with your Boston Red Sox. Can you believe it? I, 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 I knew that that about phrase. the obvious ones, but th you brought up a couple others that I really hadn't thought about before. Yeah. I have to say the phrase, can you believe it, because that's what usually we say in the playoffs <laughs> if you do win. Yeah. But can you believe yeah. it? No, we cannot believe it that the Red Sox just completely tanked, mm -hmm. as a matter of fact. But mm -hmm. let's do a little bit of a recap. Sure. In case some of you did not hear about what happened to the Red Sox, which I'm sure there's some, mm -hmm. it was a three and out. Playoffs began last Thursday, and they are gone, non-existent in this entire, yeah. um, entire playoff now. Mm -hmm. So with the playoffs over, they were swept by the Cleveland Indians. Overall thoughts on what you saw, heard, expected from this team? I, well, I was surprised, honestly. I, I think the, from what I saw, the overall, the pitching – was as I would have expected. Minus, I mean, the, the, the starters were underperforming, but mm -hmm. other than that, you knew that they would have had to hit like exactly. they did in the regular season to be successful, and, sure. they just, and they just didn't do that, which was surprising to me. Yep. I, I didn't expect them to kind of lay an egg on the offensive on, with the bats. I think a lot of this and a lot of people don't hit on it enough on what happened in this series. Mm -hmm. I think the crucial thing before it all began was the – run of the last week of the season. Mm -hmm. The last week of the season, I thought, was a, a definition on what to expect for when the playoffs began. Hmm. Nobody thought about it. A lot of people said, oh, it's just the last week of the season. Who cares? They, they already know they clinched. You see, my philosophy on what I look at is I think a team needs to ride the momentum. Mm -hmm. The momentum yeah. of playing well, hitting well, pitching well, doing all the things that are necessary before a playoff begins. Yeah. They didn't do any of it. I was telling a lot of kids in, in my programs that, I, that I've been uh, doing right. this week, mm -hmm. what grade would you give the Red Sox? And my grade is an F. Mm. There was not one thing that they did right that last week and a half of the season. Mm -hmm. I just thought it was a big disappointment. We talked about, you talked about, number one, the hitting. Mm -hmm. This is the best offensive team in baseball. Well, by a long shot. They yep. scored a number of runs more than the other teams in the league. Right. Just did not exist. Mm -hmm. It wasn't there. You can pretty much look at everybody on that roster on not hitting. But the one, the, the uh, three people that I do want to mention specifically mm -hmm. that everybody was talking about who could be great for years to come, the Killer Bees. Right. That's Mookie Betts, yeah. Jackie Bradley, Xander Bogarts. Where were their bats? Lacking. Very much lacking. The golf and it was, course. <laughs> <laughs> which, which was, again, the other, I mean, surprising based on their season. I mean, Mookie sure. Betts had a almost MVP season. An MVP season. season. I mean, I, he, if you look it at his numbers, well it was, it was, yeah, it was, very, it was they, remarkable. 30, 100, yeah. and over 300, and his, yeah. what his OPS was off the charts. But yeah. um, it, it, was, it, it was easy to forget that they had only a couple years of I will be experienced and no playoff experience. Well, I'm glad you mentioned that point. And the whole thing about the, the key phrase you said is experience. Mm -hmm. Do you think experience has something to do with why they didn't perform on the big stage? I think a little bit. Yeah. Um, because if you're not used to riding on every pitch like the MLB playoffs is and all the suspense, right. um, then I do think it makes a difference. Yeah. Although people's talent, I mean, you see people kind of react this way. The thing we talked about with the pitchers easy, like how sure. they react to different playoff scenarios. And I think it's, a little different, but similar for similar for batters um, mm -hmm. and playing in the field. And, I, and it wouldn't surprise me if that was part of it, especially because they've really only been in the league for a couple of years. Yep. No, it, it takes some time to work mm -hmm. any kind of thing in the playoff. It's a different game. Yeah. There's more pressure. It's a bigger stage. There's a higher expectation and window for you to deliver. Mm -hmm. So that yeah. could definitely have something to do with it. Mm -hmm. Out of the three, Betts, Bogarts, and Bradley, who do you think has – the highest ceiling, the most potential, the one that should be here no matter what when the offseason hits, which is right now? 
to me, it's a toss up. Well, I don't, I don't know want to say toss up, but I love Bogarts and and, um, and Betts. Yeah. I think f from the the two positions in the field, center field and shortstop. Yeah getting as much offensively as you do for them and as good as they are defensively. I know Bog Bogart's had some problems when he first came up, but he's, he's improved a lot from, yes, from what I've seen. Yeah. Um, I would say, I would say bets just yeah. because you lock him up. I, I think I would. Yeah. yeah, I think I would, I would too. And um, just because, I mean, talk about a ceiling. You hope that this, this season wasn't a ceiling, but how much better could it get off? You see, I, I, in a way don't think that he's hit his ceiling yet. Mm -hmm. I think what we're seeing from him is a guy that's going to only get better for mm -hmm. years to come. I see a guy that's a student of the game, mm -hmm. that wants to get better, that's motivated to get better, yeah. and that will kind of build around your core that's, that's there. Yeah. For Bogarts, I have to tell you, I'm extremely disappointed in Xander Bogarts' play from the second half on. Really? And that might be very harsh mm -hmm. on the way that I looked at his, his numbers, and I don't mean to put the spotlight on him, but mm -hmm. when a spotlight should be put on somebody is when you see them struggle or in a way, not want to play baseball. Hmm. I saw Xander Bogarts as a player that needed a disabled list trip, that needed hmm. a month off, that looked tired. For a guy that's 23 years old, hmm. and he's one of your youth and your core players, yeah. he's a guy that was demanding and asking John Farrell for days off to rest to get healthy, to get better. So he vocalized that to him. Like he's, oh, he's many times. Had there was a series against Tampa. I want to say it was in July. And there was a, a report. Bogarts went to one of the reporters and said, oh, I'm so tired. I just need a day off. It's just a hmm. long season. I'm exhausted. Wow. The Red Sox had an afternoon game on a Wednesday. And what John Farrell did is he played Bogarts on the Tuesday night. Uh, excuse me. He sat... He sat him on the Tuesday night, mm -hmm. played him on that Wednesday at 1 o'clock game when there was a day off the next day. Right. You could have very easily played him on that Tuesday night, gave him that Wednesday off yeah, to give him day. two days of yep. extra rest, and he did not do that. Mm -hmm. It might be a minor point to look at. Mm -hmm. It might be something that you say, why are you even bringing it up? I'm bringing it up because it's, it's signaled to me a major concern. Mm -hmm. It showed me that this guy does not have the, the grind hmm. that a Pedroia or yep. a Betts or an Ortiz mm -hmm. or, or somebody who's your cornerstone has. I'm down on Bogarts. It mm -hmm. does not mean that I don't think he's one of the best shortstop in the game. I do. Mm -hmm. If there is a package available to get talent, mm -hmm. I probably would take a look at it mm -hmm. and see if I can build my team in a, in a certain direction. Yeah. Because it is going to be difficult to sign all three. Now, the guy that I haven't brought up yet is Jackie Bradley. Mm -hmm. What do you think of Jackie Bradley? Which I believe I misspoke. Because he gets majority of time in center. Bradley doesn't. Yes, he Betts does. is a Betts yeah. isn't right. So yes. I misspoke about that yeah. before. They could, e they could play either or, yes. too. So yeah. that, that's something that it made, the versatility is huge. Yeah. Um, with Bradley, some of my what the point is making with Bogarts is that when you look at center field, to me, I want a guy that at least hits 250 if he's going to play defense like Jackie sure. Bradley and has the arm. Because to me, he can save a lot of runs out there. Mm -hmm. And especially knowing how to navigate mm -hmm. center and left center and the triangle out there at, at Fenway Park. Right. And it seems like, um, I, did, I didn't look closely enough in the second half of the season for him, but it seems like, judging from the last half of the season last year and into this year, that he right. has hit enough to be able to... Mm -hmm. Being alive, being an everyday hitter, an everyday yeah. player for them. Yeah. So that's the, that's the vibe I get about him. But I I am, if you were on if you were on my team, I'm a, I'm a Mets fan. Mm -hmm. um, if I would be very excited about him as controlling so, say, center field. I'm yeah. glad you're a Mets fan, as mm -hmm. a matter of fact, because the Mets have a lot of parts that certain put teams could need. You mm -hmm. have a lot of pitching. Yes. Jackie Bradley and other names have come up from before. Does anybody intrigue you as a Mets fan that you'd want in a potential trade? From the Red Sox? From the Red Sox. Out of those three guys or really just the Or the anybody. Team? Anybody in particular. You know, there was talk. My, my roommate and I have gone back and forth about, um, about this a little bit. More so when the Mets pitchers were healthier. Mm -hmm. um, because going down the stretch, Harvey, DeGrom, Mats, and Wheeler all were out yep. um, at the end of the season. But when they were all healthy, um, he would ask me, you know, would you trade Matt Harvey for Mookie Betts? And at mm -hmm. the time, mm -hmm. interestingly enough, I would say no because Harvey mm -hmm. was 
yep. on his game and really competitive, and he was right. he was dominating. Yep. Um, if you look at that now, You'd do it's it a lot heartbeat. different. Oh yeah, of it's a lot different. Would. Yeah. Um, a right, I mean, kind of regardless of everything else, the Mets really need a right-handed bat in the outfield right. outside of Cespedes and in their lineup. So, yeah. I mean, it, not that it's realistic, but Mookie Betts is a guy that mm -hmm. I, I would love. Well, I don't know what they would need to. You're welcome to take Jackie Bradley off our hands. Because mm -hmm. I will tell you, I'll transition into my point. You take away the month of May for Jackie Bradley. Mm -hmm. You know what he is for a hitter? He's a 215 hitter. That must have been a huge month. That's when he had his 30-game hit streak. Oh, yeah, that's right. That's when he <laughs> was hitting out of his mind. Mm -hmm. I personally cannot stand when you are a streaky hitter. I mm -hmm. cannot stand it. I would rather you be consistent across the board, mm -hmm. play your game, and put up your numbers. If you have one month and you hit 400, 500, and then you hit 200 the rest of the year, yeah. I, get real, I grow real frustrated of that player. It's true. Whether yeah. it's the glove, the bat, or whatever it is. Mm -hmm. See, my eyes on what I was able to see from Jackie Bradley is I actually thought his defense went down this year, as a matter oh. of fact. I saw a lot of throws that he had specifically in the playoff this year mm -hmm. where I'm looking at him and I'm saying, you're supposed to be a gold glove center fielder. Yeah. Why is your throw tailed off to the first base dugout? Mm -hmm. There was a couple different ones that he had in the Cleveland series where I thought he could have really nailed down that run and trying to score. Hmm. And one of them happened to be the catcher, as a matter of fact, for the Indians. Slowest guy on your team. And his throw was so far off to the left into the dugout where the Red Sox were. Mm -hmm. I was actually embarrassed looking at the play it was there. Yeah, I mean, if he's not going to play that defense, then, then it's, it's tough not to very judge. attractive. It's, yeah, it's not... tough to look at. Yeah. Personally, I think the Red Sox could get away with Blake Swihart in left field mm -hmm. and Chris Young in right field with Mookie Betts in center. Something like that. I would look in the offseason if I were Dave Dombrowski to see what you could get for Jackie Bradley. Mm -hmm. I would. I think people would take a chance on him. I think they I, could. Because I think they saw his breakout season for most of last year yep. and what he could be. I mean, he ended up finished the year 267, 26 yeah. homers, over mm -hmm. 80 RBIs. Yeah. Those are good numbers. Yeah. So if you're someone who can play really good defense. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. I think that there could be the potential for him to be probably not here next year, mm -hmm. but I think that it's a, in a way for the Red Sox. Use that as an advantage to try and get something back in return mm -hmm. that could help your ball club. Now, we talked about the offense a little bit. We have not talked about the pitching from Correct. the series that yeah. much. Mm -hmm. Now, I thought the offense was worse than the pitching, yes, but I that's agree. not to say the pitching was not disastrous mm -hmm. either. Yep. So we'll start at the top. Mm -hmm. Your ace and the staff – Absolutely was Rick Porcello. Uh, absolutely, yes. 22 game winner, 315 ERA, completely deserved the ball in game one. Mm -hmm. David Price took the ball in game two, 17 and 7, 399 ERA. My eyes, very disappointing season. Mm -hmm. Then they were going to go with Clay Buckholtz for game three. Kind of rejuvenated his career that second half of the season, mm -hmm. stepped back in the rotation, and put up some respectable numbers. So starting with game one, a little bit of a, of a thing for me is Rick Porcello only lost one game at home mm -hmm. the entire year for the Red Sox. Had to ask him to pitch game one in Cleveland right. where the Indians, they're also, their record at home is tremendous. Mm -hmm. I thought going into the game, we should get game one with Porcello on the mound. Mm -hmm. Wrong. <laughs> Turned out to be. <laughs> <laughs> Were you surprised at the performance that Porcello put up in game one? I was surprised that about the inning where he gave three home runs. And, yep. that, and that was really what broke it for him. Yep. He had never, I mean, he'd never done that all year. No. You, you didn't, he, didn't did. ha, he didn't have a stretch of three, four, five outs where he, he gave up a couple home runs. Yep. Um, and his season was kind of hard to believe, which we mentioned it before, just, just considering how opposite it was last year. Oh, my but, God. But yeah. you, knew that he was a good, you knew he was a solid pitcher from, right. from Detroit. Um, so that was surprising to me in that they really couldn't get the length, more length from mm -hmm. him and, for that matter, from, from Price. Um, because you kind, of expect it, you, you kind of expect a little more shortness mm -hmm. when you get in deeper in the series and more elimination games in the, sure. back, in the, in the farther back you get in the rotation. Yeah. Um, but in order for them to... They looked get deeper. They, they, they needed to get Porcillo. quality innings. They wanted Porcillo to be that quality arm. They could throw out seven, eight innings mm -hmm. 
make sure the bullpen doesn't step in and give the ball to Kimbrell. Yeah. I think that was the game plan going in. Yeah. We're not able to do that. Now, as much as Rick Porcillo had a great, great year, mm-hmm. he cannot, he could potentially be the Cy Young. That's, yes, which I mean, is true. amazing. Yep, it's true. The number one thing that I looked at from Porcillo, and I don't mean to be negative on it, mm-hmm. but the problem with Porcillo is he gave up way too many home runs. Yep. That also was the entire problem with the entire starting pitching staff. Explain to me how that can be an acceptable thing for allowing, which we'll get to in just a moment, your pitching coach to come back next year. I think home runs can be a little fluky. Okay. But I think over the long term, it's a concern. And if you look at, I mean, for example, Max Scherzer, Mm -hmm. for the ace for the Nationals, like led the league in home runs given up this year, but he won 20 games. Did he really? Yeah. Okay. yeah and I, I heard that yesterday. I was listening yeah. to the game. I was like, really? He yeah. really had a problem with the long ball. And I think it can be survivable um, mm-hmm. when you give up a couple solo home runs. Yep. But you can't always guarantee that people aren't going to be on base. That's, and the, it can, that's and it, the fair. And it can really hurt you. So yeah. it's a, it's a, to me, it is a, it is a significant concern. Mm-hmm. Um, and I really, you never like to see it. Yep. But it can be a survivable but you really have to do the other things well if, if that's going to happen. Well, what happened with Porcillo is he allowed three consecutive home runs mm-hmm. to the Indians in the third inning yeah. in game one. Basically, he turned the ball right over to the bullpen. Yeah. And the bullpen, it was half decent during, during the series. It really wasn't the bullpen. If you want to look at it, they did their job for the right. most part. Um, you wouldn't say that that lost them or that really put them. It in didn't a hole lose them the series. The series. Yeah. It was the pitching and the offense that completely just went downhill mm-hmm. from the start of the series. Now, leading up to the playoffs, we talked about this at the beginning a little bit, and we mm-hmm. said that they lost eight of nine right. and yep. didn't really go into the playoffs with a lot of momentum. Do you think there's any reason why that happened? I don't um, watch them closely enough on a daily basis to see if there was, I mean, obviously outside of the poor play, which is, which is more obvious. Yeah. Um, I don't know. I mean, you, you, you see sometimes how they like to give guys a little more rest towards the end and you have some of the deeper roster guys. Do you believe her in that? Expansive. I, think, I think a little bit. Okay. Um, for example, I mean, it wasn't a big deal with the Mets this year, but they were in a similar position last year where they had won mm-hmm. the division. Yep. A week and a half a week before the season ended. Yep. So, you know, did the whole thing with the game after. They got the, the beeline up out there. And it's still, I mean, you still like to give, especially some of the banged up guys, the everyday guys rest. Yep. They actually lost five out of the last six games in their season. Yep. Leading up to the last game of the season, they lost five in a row. Right. So, for me personally, I was like, and they weren't hitting at all. Right. For me personally, I was like, I really, I really feel a lot better if they won this last game. Yeah. And it turned out they won it one to nothing. So they still yeah. didn't hit. Right. But they had to win on the board and you felt good yep. going into the playoffs. Yep. So that's a little different because they won. At right. the least they won at the end of the season. Right. But um, I, think, I think it makes a difference more than probably most people right. realize. Although I don't, I, but I, at the same time, I do think that the postseason is a different season and things can change in a heartbeat there. Oh, it's a whole, so it's, it's, to me, it's, it's hard to judge. Different game. It's hard to judge. Entirely yeah. different game. Um, I feel that they've lo- they lost a lot of their focus. Mm-hmm. They were extremely distracted. And I think that personally was the reason why they didn't do well against the Indians. Let's go back to when we had the 11-game winning streak. Mm-hmm. The 11-game yeah. winning streak was when things were riding high. They beat the Yankees for four. They beat the Orioles for four, I believe. No, the Orioles for th- uh, yeah for four. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And then the Rays for three. It was a great stretch. It kind of uh, clinched that division in a way for the Red Sox, which was an outstanding feat. In a hurry, yeah. I mean, you, you look twice, and they were up seven games in the division. You know, I yep. mean, it's, it was really surprising. Then it was almost, to me, looking back on it, almost like they peaked too early. Mm-hmm. And from peaking too early, you crashed and burned pretty early too. This season, to me, was very similar to how they played in 2011, the mm. chicken and beer year. Mm. Yep. They had a great team all the way up until September. And then the last weeks of the season, they just went downhill and got themselves right out of the playoffs. Mm. That was the final end of Terry Francona and Jonathan Papelbon. They had that huge lead, but pretty big lead yep. in the division too, yes, right? And they, they just did. threw it away. Yes, yeah. they did. And they just completely threw it away. Mm-hmm. The distraction I felt came right from the top. 
right from the top is your manager in charge of running the asylum. That's John Farrell. <laughs> mm -hmm. I felt the season almost in a way ended at Yankee Stadium. And mm. it was the game where Craig Kimbrell gave up the Grand Slam to yep. Mark Teixeira. Yep. It looked like the Yankees had just won the World Series. Celebrating at home plate, happy as mm -hmm. anything, looked like it was an amazing thing for them. Well, the Red Sox can go right into the clubhouse afterwards and celebrate themselves after giving up that Grand Slam because they, they had just clinched the division. Mm -hmm. Mm. Many Red Sox players didn't know what to do when they got into the clubhouse. Should yeah. they have felt bad? Should they not have celebrated? Should they not have gone the way they did? Well, you know who started the whole thing? It was John Farrell. I have my opinions, and I know Phil Healy, when he was on the show, expressed mm -hmm. his thoughts on it, but John Farrell allowed them to go crazy, celebrate, mm. have, their, yeah. have their thing in the dugout, after, in my opinion, one of the worst losses that you can have in a baseball game. Yeah, what I, mean, I would have done, yeah. mm -hmm. I would have told my team, you guys have come a long way, but we're going to hold back on the celebration until we get home and win a game in front of our fans. Mm -hmm. Done. But no, he doesn't allow that to happen. He allows the guys to completely run all over him, to, to go in there and, and party it up mm -hmm. like they just lost the whole World Series, basically. What do you think? Would you have done it differently? I find, I do find that situation uncomfortable. I mean, okay. you, you, don't, you don't lose many games where you lose on a walk-off Grand Slam, regardless no. if you are far above, far better than the other team you make in the, in the playoffs or not. Yeah. So I would have found it uncomfortable, and I, wouldn't have no, I really wouldn't have been completely comfortable celebrating either, but I do think that it's almost automatic in the game now that, you know, once you know you're in the playoffs, then no matter what, yep. you're in. So I think it, it would have impressed me if he, it would have impressed me to a higher degree if he had said that and be like, listen, guys, this was not good enough. We need to yep. get back home and win. Mm -hmm. That's a tall order to me, mm -hmm. but I certainly would have been impressed by it, and I think it would have been better. Yep. It would have made more sense. The David Ortiz celebration, I think that had another factor on why this team went downhill as as much as they did mm -hmm. i think there was so much of an emphasis on making sure david went out on his own right. on his terms mm -hmm. uh bringing everybody back and not focusing on the game yeah focusing on the celebration and just saying you know what what happens happens in these games do you, so you think that is the vibe you got from, from the, the team or the fans? From that... the team, I got, I got that vibe. And I thought the celebrations were great. Mm -hmm. But I think that they could have waited on these celebrations for after you win a World Series. That's my thought. Wouldn't mm -hmm. that have been cool to have you know a great celebration at Fenway Park for mm -hmm. David Ortiz, his last times there, and celebrate it that way? It would have been iconic. But then again, what... like. The Avs didn't win it, and if mm -hmm. they hadn't celebrated, mm -hm. what would they? Well, what what would you? What would well, they have done? Well, even if they got to the playoffs, like the three game exit after okay, that so game. Okay, so after, give a day, next day, day I or see. two okay. after, have one big David Ortiz celebration right, right there. So it doesn't distract from the play on the field. Exactly, yeah. it's almost like you had two performances going on. You mm -hmm. had the opening act, which was the David Ortiz. We're gonna give you this. We're gonna bring all your players back right. out, mm -hmm. and then you had a ball game. Your ball game should always be number one, no That's matter what. You. And I'm sorry. Yes, it is a show. It mm -hmm. is a, it is a, um, a big experience and all. But baseball is the emphasis, and that never should have been taken away. Mm -hmm. That was taken away, and by doing that, it almost took a back seat to the real message and the real journey and what this season was about. Winning it all yeah. for David Ortiz and going out on the top. And guess what? Epic fail. And it made things really awkward, might be a strong role, but really fascinating to see how he would react at the end because mm -hmm. you know that's the last thing that he wanted and maybe even expected. This, this is season. one of the worst ways for him to go out. Yeah, like for such a great postseason player, he getting swept yeah. in, the in the division series mm -hmm. by a team that has, is down two of their starting, best starting pitchers. Mm -hmm. I was I, the whole, a lot of the whole, a lot of that whole series was unexpected and interesting in that way because 
you don't know how they were going to react. No, you didn't. And that last last part of it with the, with the camera on David Ortiz and the dugout going yeah. into the clubhouse right after they lost. It was sad. Yeah. It was very it sad was. to see the way it was going to go out there. Mm-hmm. Now, I said on this show, first day when that announcement was made that Ortiz is going to be retiring, mm-hmm. I said, I'll believe it when I see it. <laughs> I have to tell you, I'm still sitting here and I'm contemplating what to think about what David Ortiz will do still. I do have to tell you that. Mm-hmm. And there's a lot of people that say, oh, you're out of your mind. He's not coming back. He told you he's done. Give it four months, folks. He's going to be sitting in the Dominican. He's going to be hungry. He's going to feel like he's missing the game so much. Mm -hmm. I would not be surprised to see something happen next year that gets him over the top to come back, whether it's midseason or do something. Yes, it was one of the best farewell tours that there was there. Mm -hmm. I get that. The man can still play baseball. Look at his season. Like, what, again, similar. I mean, he has so much season in Mookie Betts, and that's saying yeah. something. I mean, what he almost led the league in doubles, 30 home runs, what, 110 RBIs. Like, he's, what is he, 41? He could be, he could be the MVP. Yeah. He could like, very well be the MVP. It's unbelievable. So don't be surprised. I'm sure I'm going to see people probably already saying, well, you out of your mind. He said he was going to retire. I'll believe it when I see it. Mm-hmm. That's how I'll call that. Now, the one thing that I would love to call right now mm-hmm. and tell them that he was gone would be John Farrell. But I can't do that because they don't have his <laughs> phone number right now. So if anybody has his phone number, please give it to me. I know his address for 4 Yorkie Way, but I need that personal call. How is this man back? How? You heard a lot of chatter throughout the whole season, of, especially when they were doing, not doing the best that – People wanted him out. And really, it's been like that for the last couple of years since they won in 2013. I was surprised, not as surprised that he's coming, that they said he'd come back. I was surprised they made, they declared it a day after the season ended. Yeah. Like they didn't even give time to think about it themselves. I don't, yeah. they must have seen something that brought them confidence. I don't, I don't really know, but I was, I was surprised that they made did it so quickly. Did you hear what Dave Dombrowski did before, letting, before telling John Farrell that he was back? No. Well, John Farrell was on his way to go to the bathroom in the hallway at the press conference, mm-hmm. and Dombrowski said he walked by John and said that, oh, yeah, you're coming back next year. So, so he didn't, he had not he didn't had a discussion. Hey, he didn't, they didn't have a discussion with him before that. Seems to me they didn't have a discussion. How interesting, interesting is that? Because do you, think that, do you think John Farrell just assumed that? He was gone. Do you think he assumed he was I gone? I did. I really? did think he was gone. Wow. Le- that, that's, that really opened my eyes with Dombrowski. I was a big oppon- uh, proponent for him coming mm-hmm. in and being the, the person in charge. Mm-hmm. Boy, looking back on this season and the moves he made, I, 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 it's, it's, I'm sad to say it, but I give him a D. Um, he, he did not. They were I underwhelming would, at if best. If Ben Sherrington yeah. were here, mm-hmm. I think that we would have been, would have been better. And I can't believe I'm saying that because a year ago, at this stage, sitting here, I would say to myself, oh, Dombrowski's in. Everything's mm-hmm. great now. Yep. It's amazing how much a year can change your it's true. opinion. true. Yeah. And that's how I feel on the Dombrowski end. Mm-hmm. Farrell coming back was one piece that kind of got me going on Tuesday right. when that announcement was made. The next piece that got me going, the entire staff is back. That is is maddening to me. You have pitching coach back, which I think we all know the pitching was the biggest disappointment of this team so Mm -hmm. far. And you're also bringing back your hitting coach. This one can take a little bit of criticism from because the hitting was one of the best offenses regular Mm season-wise in the game. But you failed in the big stage when it mattered the most. Mm -hmm. And that's why I would have made the change right there. You need a new direction in my eyes. Mm-hmm. So who, what changes would you have made on the coaching, clean house. On the coaching staff? Really? Clean house. The only one I would have brought back was a guy named Brian Bannister who came mm-hmm. in as the second in command for the pitching coach. He was more of that analytical guy. He was more, let's look at the things that are not working for you mm-hmm. and making you better. He helped put Clay Buckholz back on track. Mm-hmm. So Bannister... I personally would make him the pitching coach. Hmm. Tell Carl Willis to pack his bags. You, we've seen enough. I would have put, if I had the chance to, if I were manager, mm-hmm. 
Now, I'm going to put my Dave Dombrowski hat on. If I were him, he might not want to have ties with anybody else on that coaching staff. He may want to just clean slate. Because Tori LaFulo could be that guy who could be your manager. Uh-huh. That's Which a lot choice. of them liked when he, when he filled in last year. I liked year. him a lot. Yeah. It looked like he was a guy that the players, he got the players to play for him. Mm-hmm. Players re, re, uh, respect him a lot. But the wild card on this and what I would really do. Now, I've, I've taken a couple bits of criticism from this because a lot of people think he's not ready. Well, ready or not, he's going to be coming soon, Jason Veritek. Mm. That's my man for hmm. a manager, and I think it's wow. going to be coming sh- coming very soon. He's in the he's in the front office. He, he's a little he's and a he's support staff there. He's been in the dugout there. a yeah. lot too. Has he? Okay. So he's getting that experience. Hmm. I just think Veritek right now probably doesn't want it right right now. Mm-hmm. But I think he's getting to that stage where it's going to be his team very shortly. That's my bold move. That so, but you wouldn't put him in there. You wouldn't like get rid of Fred. Personally, put him in I would now. put him in right now. You would, okay. I, I give him that trust. That, but I don't think a lot of the owners give him that mm-hmm. right now. I think that he needs a little bit of minor league ball or mm-hmm. some right. sort of coaching experience to him. Yeah, that makes sense. Because yeah. I, I would have assumed that if the Red Sox fans that would have wanted John Farrell gone would have wanted to immediately put Lavuto in there from what yeah. happened last year. I, I'd be fine with Lavuto too. I mm-hmm. think I, what I saw enough from last year was a big enough sample size to see that he could get the job done. Yeah. So whether he's going to be a manager here or whether he goes to manage in another team, I think we'll see that shortly. But I think mm-hmm. Lavulo deserves a managerial job, definitely. So it, so it seems like with the way the season ended and the struggles ahead on their team this year that you put more of the onus on the coaching staff as opposed to the players. You, are you confident in the personnel from the player standpoint? You'd rather see changes in the coaching staff. I think the coaches, I thought John Farrell – was a terrible manager. Hmm. I think he is one of the is a terrible in-game manager where you have to go to your bullpen, make moves, doesn't know how to strategize and make the right call on certain plays. Mm-hmm. Players, they totally deserve criticism as well. Mm-hmm. I think a lot of it has to do with getting out of slumps. I look at a player like Jackie Bradley. I think it's unacceptable on how he played towards the end of pretty much mid-June on mm-hmm. without really any kind of ramif- you know, ramifications. Yeah. John Farrell continued to stick and stick and stick and stick and stick with these guys, mm-hmm. and they continue to fail. So that right there is where I look at your manager and say, you know what? I see. You pull yeah. your trigger and you put somebody else into those spots. Mm-hmm. So for me, for, for, for like starting lineup for the Indians, Sandy Leon was not my starting catcher. I mm-hmm. would have looked right back at Christian Vasquez, put a good guy that handles your staff, that can throw a guy out at second mm-hmm. base. Yeah. I would have traded the offense for the defense to shut down their run game and to make the pitchers feel more yeah. comfortable with someone behind the plate. So I was surprised that they kind of canned him and sent him down like partway through the season. You didn't really see him after that. You like, did. What was the story there? There, there was a little bit of a, a discrepancy with – there was a – uh, Stephen Wright was pitching. We have not mentioned Stephen Wright, mm-hmm. but Stephen Wright was on the mound. It was a rainy game, and Vasquez was catching for him. And Vasquez called for a fastball when the coaching staff was calling for a knuckleball, apparently, ah, during the game. Right. Okay. Well, mm-hmm. that, that fastball was hit for a grand slam out of the park, mm-hmm. and that kind of ticketed Vasquez exit down to Pawtucket. That so, only, or were there other things? I that think there were other things, but that was the big one that I heard. Oh, there was okay. a lot of behind-the-scenes uh, name calling specifically ah, that we can't okay. talk about really on air mm-hmm. because we'll get FCC'd. So <laughs> got it. <laughs> Unless we're Cause... guessing. Did you hear? You know what I mean. I didn't that? know. I didn't oh, hear okay. it too. That that when they was swearing and everything on 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 Nesson after the after that Yankee celebration thing. Oh really? So you, you mean that. they didn't? It was it was the on field oh, video yeah, it, and it they, was, they it just didn't footage. filter it. Oh yeah. yeah. Uh-huh. Go back and watch that. That's a fun that. one. But anyways, that there, there's a little bit of behind the scenes things going on. Yeah, with because with Vasquez, I, I mean, I know he had the Tommy John last year. It was Tommy John, right? I mean, yeah. it was a serious yeah, surgery. But yeah. I, I mean, not being a Red Sox fan, I loved him before yeah. when I saw him because I mean, you saw the guy with the yeah. defensive skills. And You'll the, probably see him as your starter next year. I would. I mean, I, that's what it's I would. A little bit to do Sox with hitting, fan. but yeah. he has to hit the ball. But I think that they'll put him back. But I agree there. in the sense that for the catcher, I would want to see a guy who knows how to handle staff, yeah. and is a good defensive guy back yeah. there because they're in every play. Yep. Yeah. No, yeah. I completely think that. Uh, I know we got to wrap up our show very quickly, but again, um, I, I the last thing I just want to bring up is Stephen Wright is somebody that I really wish that they had in the playoff. Mm-hmm. He had a great regular season. John Farrell blew his arm basically by having him slide at second base. Should never have pinch yeah, run for I, him. 
Never. I don't understand. Should it. never have been at second base for to be a pinch runner. Never understood it. That was the most stupid thing that happened, and, and he, it kind of ruined your pitching staff in a way. To you know, for the bottom line, he had players on the bench that he could have used, and he didn't. Yep. And he didn't explain. Could have put Pomeranz in because Pomeranz yeah. was a National League guy at the time. Yeah, put like one of your relievers in. You Anybody. Know. Yeah. But you put your guy that was pitcher. pretty much your All Star, who's your ace, out there, and he never pitched again. It's hard to explain. Very, that, that, that's my number one thing on Farrell yeah. that t- tells me to, to go away. Now, outside of the Red Sox, we have also other, other teams mm. that are in the hunt for a World Series. We have the Dodgers and the Cubs, and we have the uh, Blue Jays and the Indians. Mm-hmm. Do you have a particular favorite out of the four? Favorite team? Yeah. Or who could win um, it, basically? Who could win it? I know a lot of people looking at the Cubs. Yeah. I'm not sold that they're going to roll through everyone. Okay. I know they handled the Giants, but the Giants had a terrible second half. Mm-hmm. Um, and we saw how bad their bullpen was yep. um, at the end of game four when they gave up those four or five runs in the ninth inning. Yep, yep. Um, the Dodgers are a different team this year. Now, a, yes, lot of people, a lot of people have gotten them fast because they haven't had that grinded out toughness that, you know, they, they mostly won the division, but they didn't do much after that. Um, they're a different team, especially after Kershaw's save last night. You, yep. You, you would like to see him, like, be his dominant self in the playoffs. Mm-hmm. Yep. Um, the Indians also, we were talking about how they have that sort of, like, extra magic going mm-hmm. on that, that you'd like to see. Yep. Um, and the Blue Jays just pound you. Mm-hmm. I mean, you look at that line of 1-8, to 1-9, to nine, and there's something there. Yep. This may be a cop-out. I don't, I don't know. I, I, I'm looking forward to it. I think it's going to be great. You know, mm-hmm. they have a, exciting teams in a lot of different ways and, mm-hmm. you know, fun markets. Yep. Um, Having having said that, I think I just I want to see what the Cubs are going to do. I just it seems like uh, they, it the seems Cubs. like they don't have a weakness. I mean, yeah. if you look at what they did this year, especially with adding the back of the ball with, with Chapman mm-hmm. and their starting pitchers. I mean, look, they're all four have yeah. significant or really good or have significant playoff experience, especially with yeah. Lackey and Lester. Yeah. So I think to me that is the team I'm looking for to break through and kind of. Get to the end. I, I, I wouldn't mess with the Lackey Lester Ross combination. They've yeah. won it in 2013. Mm-hmm. They're riding high from that playoff World Series win. Um, I look at the Cubs as the team. I think it's their year finally. Mm-hmm. After 108 years, they're going to put that Billy Goat to sleep finally. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> and I think you'll see. I think you'll see the Indians and the Cubs. That would be cool. I I think that'd be a lot of fun. Now I yeah. told you off air that I had a really funny line that I wanted to talk yeah. about. So yeah, here's right. my thing. So what I, I would love to see us fans do, in a way, is be able to get John Henry, Larry Lucchino, and Tom Werner to uh, every single one of these games, if it's between the Cubs and the Indians. Do you know mm-hmm. why? Because the, well, the connection. Because of the right. major connection. Yeah. But what I want them to do is sit front row seat and to watch every single play. You have Theo Epstein versus Terry yeah. Francona. Mm-hmm. How okay. amazing would that be? It's, I mean, it's just going to be real fun. You had these guys, yeah. you big buffoons, and you let them go. <laughs> it's pathetic. It's all about, see, I'm not as big of a fan with the core ownership with the Red Sox. Mm-hmm. I was a Theo guy. I was yeah. somebody that really liked what he did. I thought he was the heart and soul of your team. Mm-hmm. Lucchino was the one that ruined it all, I mm-hmm. thought. He was the one that had to be the power guy, that oh, I'm the boss, and what I say goes, mm-hmm. and you can't get away with any of these things. Well, Theo goes off to the Cubs and now finds a winning formula. In a span of two or three years, too. I mean, he took a, a, one of the worst teams He's in baseball. He's the best to, general manager may, may possibly team. be in baseball history, mm-hmm. I think. If he wins with the Cubs, he's cemented himself throughout baseball history and legacy. I mean, his legacy is, will be not one of a kind. So for the typical Red Sox fan, how do you think – well, first of all, do you think that they would be into that series? Do you think that they would be attracted to watch it because no, because they of will that, not watch it. Because of they that. They will not watch that series. Because of the connections or because – Because of the connections and because I think that they're disgusted with how wrong they were. Hmm. So it almost to me would be a pride thing. Interesting. So – they blew it with Lester. They blew it with Francona. They blew it with Epstein. They blew it with Lackey. They blew it with them all. And that's what you get. That's the price you get. It's kind of comical to look back <laughs> and see what we have right now there for your teams. But I'm rooting for the Cubs. Mm-hmm. Um, I wouldn't be disappointed with any of them winning. I mean, there yeah. was some sort of a connection. And the other thing I, I heard was that there's, with them all. there's all with all of them, um, 
that there's all a drought of at least 20 years since the World Series. Yeah. And with the Cubs and the Indians, that's the longest with 08 and 40. So it will know. be somebody fresh. Yeah, someone will be breaking which through. Which will be pretty nice, too. Yeah. Well, that's going to do it here for our episode of Face the Facts. We unfortunately ran out of time for today, but we hope you enjoyed our uh, lovely discussion that yeah, we I had, had fun. about all things baseball. Mm -hmm. So, Brad, first time, we want to thank you for being here. You're welcome. We also want to make sure that we um, let our viewers, too, know that Next week, amazingly, is the 10th year anniversary of Face the Facts. So that means that we will be partying it up a little bit. So we will be celebrating the 10 years. So stay tuned for a special, uh, special little anniversary thing that we'll be doing. So I'm Nick Face. We will see you next time on Face the Facts. Goodbye.